So that's exciting. Revelation chapter 7. Let's stand together. I'll read some of this chapter, if not all of it. It's been wonderful going through this book of the Bible. And I trust the Lord's going to use it in our hearts tonight. Verse 1. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. And they were sealed in hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Aser were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Nephtalim were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and under the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. One of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell, dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Amen. Let's pray. Father, please bless now as I preach thy word. I pray a fresh filling of your spirit. I pray that you'd lead and direct my thoughts and my words. And Lord, may, when we hear the word of God, may we respond to it as it is in truth. Not the words of men, but the very word of God. Please give us understanding tonight. And Lord, I pray that this message would not just be an informational message, but we would take the message and see how exactly it applies to us today, here in the church age, as church age saints. And so I pray again that you'd lead and direct my thoughts and words for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now tonight, uh, we are here in the seventh chapter of the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, remember, it was back in chapter 4, and you can go back there a moment if you'd like to just glance. In chapter 4 and verse 1, that the Apostle John, who is a picture of church age believers, was raptured into heaven. We read that in verse 1 where he says, uh, He heard, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. 
So here the Apostle John finds himself after chapter 4 and verse 1 standing before the very throne of God. I could see his eyes as big as saucers, you know. Kind of like when you and I leave this world, when we close our eyes and open them up in glory. Can you imagine what our faces are going to be like? Praise God for that. Amen. But anyway, he gets into heaven and he sees surrounding this throne, again, so many things, and I'm not going to go through them all, but he does see four cherubim-like beasts that the Bible calls, uh, similar to those that we find in Ezekiel chapter 1 and Isaiah chapter 6. He sees the 24 elders, which are representatives of uh, the church age saints, uh, those that were raptured. Uh, he sees this great host of angels, and for the remaining of the chapter 4 and into chapter 5, each of these groups, we see them proclaiming praise and glory and honor uh, to him that sat on the throne. And then in chapter 5, when it begins, uh, John, of course, sees uh, in the hand of God a book. Uh, we know that it's a scroll, a book that was sealed with seven seals. Now we know that this scroll contains the tribulation judgments that God is about to pour out upon this earth. And they're looking for someone. Uh, the question is asked, who is worthy to open this book? Who is worthy to loose these seals? And they find that the only one that is found worthy to open the seals is none other than the lion of the tribe of Judah, uh, the root of David, the holy one of God who has been slain for the sins of the world, the one who is soon to return and reveal himself as the king of kings and lord of lords, none other than Jesus Christ himself. And we find as chapter 6 begins that Jesus Christ now takes this book and he begins to open this seven seal book one seal at a time. And by the time we get to the end of the chapter and I preached on this last week, this world will have experienced those first six seals which we know take place rather quickly and also take place during the first three and a half years of the tribulation. Seals, judgments, if you will, that totally devastate this world. You remember there was that first seal found in verses 1 and 2, which was that white horse, and that was a picture of the Antichrist being revealed. Then we saw the second seal in verses 3 and 4, which was a red horse, which uh, uh, represents civil unrest, where breaking out all over this world, uh, we find uh, wars and rumors of wars and men killing one another uh, in that second seal. The third seal we find in verses 5 and 6, the black horse, where a deathly famine comes across this world. The fourth seal we find in verses 7 and 8, which is a pale horse, horse which represents death. Imagine masses upon masses of people now are going to die for several reasons. Some of them because of the famine. Other than, others because of incurable diseases. Others are attacked by wild animals. But one-fourth of the population of this world is going to die by the sixth seal. May I remind us tonight that that is 1.8, not million, but billion people. That's a lot of people. And then the next seal we find, the fifth one, and I said the wrong number, but the fifth seal is martyrdom. We find that in verse 9. And uh, those that are now coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ during the tribulation. Again, again, Bibles will be still here. Tracts will be here. Other things. People are getting saved. But as they get saved, uh, they're going to suffer great persecution. They're, they're going to be martyred. And there will be, uh, during the time of that fifth seal, a wholesale slaughter of believers throughout the tribulation. And we'll see some more of that tonight. And then we find that sixth seal in verses 12 to verse 17 where we find uh, God's wrath expressed now uh, in disasters in the natural realm. It begins in verse 12 with a great earthquake. 
It's followed by a, a hail of meteor, a meteor shower. Imagine that, striking the earth. Uh, the Bible says that the heavens are going to part uh, as a scroll, and every mountain and every island on the face of the earth is going to be moved out of their place. What a tremendous earthquake is going to take place. But perhaps the saddest thing of these six seals is what we find in the closing verses of chapter 6, that instead of men repenting, instead of them coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ, many of them, yes, some will be getting saved, but many men will hide in the dens uh, and hide in the rocks of the mountains uh, and cry out, fall on us and hide us from the face of him, in verse 16, that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Sad, isn't it? But that concludes the sixth judgment seals in Revelation chapter 6. But now before that seventh and final seal is opened, by the way, there's only one more seal. But I know in that seal it contains seven trumpet judgments and also seven vile, or some call them bold, a bold judgments. That is opened if you look at chapter 8, verse 1. We read, and when he had opened the seventh seal, we find kind of a pause in the action here. God pauses these judgments for a moment here until he does something that he desires to do. You say, what is that? We find it in verse 3. We read, saying, hurt not the earth neither the sea nor the trees notice till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Tonight I'd like to preach on the subject of this, the sealed servants. Who are they? Who are they? And why are they here? Well, let's get right into the, the, the meat of the message, if you will, and see if we can't figure this out. What's going on here? Why the pause? Why the raising up of these people? What are they here for? Well, let's notice, first of all, as we look at our text, number one, I'm going to give us four things about these servants tonight. We see the reliability of God. Now, notice how this thing begins. We find in verse 1, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now understand, throughout the Bible, God very often uses angels to accomplish certain aspects of his work in this world. For example, we read in the days of Abraham that God used angels to deliver a message uh, to Abraham uh, uh, to come and visit him. We read in the days of Daniel that God used angels there uh, to deliver to Daniel answers to prayer. We read in the days of Elijah that God used angels to provide for his people, his man in particular, named Elijah. But we also find throughout the Bible that God uses angels many times to execute his judgment upon the earth. Now we find that in the days of King David. If you remember the story when David numbered the people, you say, what is that sin of numbering the people? Well, I believe he did it in somewhat of a prideful way. God told him not to do it, uh, that God sent an angel to judge. And we find that throughout the book of the Revelation as well. Now, here we find something interesting. Notice in verse 1, four angels that are assigned to stand on the four corners of the earth, notice what they do. We read that they, they, it's told that they hold back the four winds of the earth. What does that mean? What exactly does that mean? Hmm. We know in uh, here, these angels, what they're doing is they're actually placing God's uh, program, if you will, in check. God is using them to, for a moment here, now, mind you, we just saw in chapter 6, all kinds of things happen one after the other. Now these four angels are sent and commanded by God to hold this thing in check. 
to stop the judgments, if you will, to stop the natural disasters, to stop any further advancement of the Antichrist, and uh, to stop any more hurt to occur on the face of the earth until the servants of God are sealed. Now, I don't know exactly what that's going to be like, but from what I read, I'd imagine for a moment there was a death-like silence in all the earth. Think about that. Screaming people from meteors falling, men in the dens hiding, saying, fall on us, all kinds of natural disasters, famine, and so forth. Then for a time, everything gets quiet. Not even a breath of wind. Why did God do this? Because he wants to seal his servants. What does that mean? What does it mean he wants to seal his servants? Well, let me see if I can not explain it to you. You know, since Genesis chapter 3, all the way through Revelation chapter 22, and of course, Genesis chapter 3 would be the fall of man, Revelation 22, the new heavens and the, and the new earth, God has always had, and by the way, it's so simple if you think about it, God has always had one primary goal in mind. And that is this, that all of mankind would be saved. That's the theme of the whole Bible. God himself redeeming mankind to himself by the sacrifice of himself. We read in 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4, who will have all men to be saved. God wants everyone to be saved. He's always wanted that. And even during the tribulation period, although he is, uh, his wrath is being blown out, if you will, on, on this world, uh, he wants men uh, to be saved. And remember that salvation is the same throughout the entire Bible. There's not a salvation in the Old Testament that's different from a salvation in the New Testament. Some people have the idea that under different dispensations, salvation was different. It's never been different. It's always been the same. It's always been through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Now in the Old Testament, they believed on the Christ that was to come. And in the New Testament days where we are, we believe on the Christ that has already came. But again, salvation has always been through faith in Christ. But can I remind us that there is a primary means that God has chosen to use to deliver this message to the world. You say, how is that? Well, he's not writing it in the clouds. He's not uh, sending little notes from heaven, if you will. He does it a different way primarily. You say, what is that way? Go over to Romans chapter 10, if you will. Romans chapter 10. Because we see the means God has, God uses, to get the message out. Perhaps one of our favorite passages, as we talk to people about the Lord, is Romans chapter 10 and verses 9 through 13. That displays the simplicity of salvation. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. Notice, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's wonderful, isn't it? Anybody, anywhere that repents of their sin and trusts Jesus Christ as their Savior and calls upon him will be saved. But let's look at the next verse because this is very important as well. We read in verse 14, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Now notice the logic here. A person cannot call upon the name of the Lord by faith unless he's believed. 
But he cannot believe on the Lord unless he's heard the message. And he cannot hear the message unless somebody's told him. And that somebody, by the way, is named here in Romans 10, 14 as a preacher. And where is a preacher from? Notice in verse 15, and how shall they preach except they be what? Sent, may I ask you tonight, who sends them? God does. So preachers come, imagine this, called preachers from the very throne of God. So understand that God chooses to use saved men as instruments to deliver his message of salvation. Now we find this throughout history. God has never left this world without a witness. In the days of Adam, it was Adam. He told his son Abel about the Lord. It began from there, from Abel witnessing to Cain. That one didn't turn out so good, uh, but Abel still witnessed. Uh, we saw Seth and his offspring continue this godly line of witnessing. Again, God has never left this world without a witness. Hold your hand here. I want to show you something interesting. Just, we have time. Go to Genesis chapter 4. Notice what we read in verse 26. We read, And to Seth, to him also, there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Notice this phrase. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Well, that sounds familiar. That sounds like Romans chapter 10 and verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What I'm trying to show us here is that there has always been a godly witness in this world. Again, Adam uh, was witnessing to Abel, Abel uh, to Cain, Seth to his offspring, uh, Noah and his sons uh, and their descendants preached the gospel to their generation. Then God raised Abraham up in the nation of Israel to be his representatives on this earth for centuries. When uh, Israel apostatized, uh, God set them aside and raised up the local New Testament church to do the very same thing, to preach the gospel to every creature. Now understand when we get to Revelation uh, chapter 4, the local New Testament church is gone, uh, and God will not leave this world without a witness. And so what does he do? He calls more men. He raises up servants once again, that man can hear the gospel and be saved. And notice, he will not allow the tribulation to continue until he has called a generation of preachers. Even during the seven-year tribulation, God desires for all men to be saved. You see, that's the reliability of God. That's the way, you know, some people say, well, what if somebody in some far-out place has never heard? You know what, let's just leave that in the hands of God. I believe God is good. I believe God has his work going in this world of things we don't even know. And his character, uh, think about it. Uh, certainly he's not going to leave somebody to not hear it, but he may. But I'm just saying, he's perfect. And he does nothing wrong. He is reliable. He is going to make sure when hearts are prepared that a witness will be there. And that's what he does during the tribulation. So the reliability of God. Notice, secondly, the restoring of the Jews. So who are they? Hmm. Back to Revelation chapter 7. Well, there's 144,000 of them. Look at verse 4. And I heard the number of them, which were sealed, and they were sealed and 144,000. Notice what it says here. Of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So what's happening here? First of all, God's not leaving this world without a witness. And so he turns to a people. Who are they? Well, we're told exactly who they are. He says there's 12,000 from each of the following tribes. I won't read that all again, but notice 12,000 from the tribe of Judah, 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben and Gad and Asher and Naphtali and Manasseh and Simeon and Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and, uh, and Benjamin. You know what's interesting about this? If you look at that, there's two tribes missing. Hmm. But there's still 12. Interesting. Tribes of Dan and the tribe of Ephraim are not there. Why? Well, you know, your guess is as good as mine. But many believe that uh, this is because of the place, the role that they played in the Old Testament 
in uh, Israel's apostasy. And so now God is using these tribes, if you will. But the point is this, and you could argue who, uh, the, that point as long as you like, but the point is this, words cannot be plainer. These 144,000 are Jews, nothing but Jews. That's what they are. You know, these same men are mentioned again in Revelation chapter 14. Would you turn there, please? Where we get a little bit more insight as to who they are. Notice Revelation chapter 14, and we'll get to this again a little bit later, God willing. In verse 1, And I looked, and lo, a, a lamb stood on the, on the Mount Sion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads, and I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song. Notice, but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were, watch this, redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, notice, being the first fruits unto God and unto the Lamb. So notice as we put those two passages together, we can find out some things about this 144,000. First of all, again, they were Jews. 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes listed. We also know they were men. They were males. We know that they were unmarried. We know that they were virgins. We know that they were saved. They were redeemed. We know that they were called of God into the ministry. They were marked out and under God's protective care. Understand what happened. God calls them. They're protected from the onslaughts of the Antichrist and the unbelieving world until their work is complete. They're Jewish evangelists that will evangelize during the tribulation. Notice they're listed as the first fruits of God out of Israel in the last days. They're not Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, I read those two passages, and those are the only two places that you find the, the 144,000. And for someone to say that those are Je, Je, the 144,000 uh, best Jehovah's Witnesses that are, go to heaven, where in the world do you get that? It's not in the Bible. You know what I think they do? I think they play on our ignorance. Because many, uh, uh, many Christians are not familiar with who they are, and they play on that, and they proclaim something that's not true to force their doctrine down your throat and mine. But these are tribulation Jews that are saved and the first fruits of God out of Israel. What is happening here is we're seeing the nation of Israel now turning back to the true and living God and being restored as agents of the gospel in this world. Oh, it's a wonderful thing. May I say another proof that the church is gone. Now, lest you think that understanding or that preaching about who they are isn't right, this is exactly what God said he was going to do. Let me show you what I mean. Go all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Notice what we read. In verse 24, here is Moses with the second generation. This first generation ha has died off. And Moses is going to speak some prophetic things about the future of the nation of Israel. We read in Roman, uh, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 24. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. Now notice, when thou be, uh, shall beget children and children's children, and ye shall have remained long in the land, and shall corrupt yourselves, and make a graven image, or the likeness of anything, and shall do evil in the sight of the Lord thy God, to provoke him to anger. 
I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that ye shall soon utterly perish from off the land whereunto ye go over Jordan to possess it. Ye shall not prolong your days upon it, but shall utterly be destroyed. And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations, and ye shall be left few in number among the heathen whither the Lord shall lead you. And there ye shall serve gods and the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat uh, nor smell. But, notice this, but if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him. If thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Notice this. When thou art in tribulation and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God and shall be obedient unto his voice, for the Lord thy God is a merciful God, he will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers which he sware unto them. There it is. God says in the latter days, if you turn to me, I'm going to restore you. And I am going to fulfill the covenants that I promised. And by the way, those covenants have not been fulfilled yet. But they will be. They will be during the millennium. But it's going to take the tribulation period to get Israel back to God. Turn over to Romans chapter 11, lest you think that it's only one time in the scriptures, although we only need it once. Romans chapter 11, and look, look at verse 25. Notice we read, For I would not, brethren, uh, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. There it is. You see, these Jewish evangelists are Jews that God raises up during the tribulation that will exhort this world uh, uh, to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Their message is going to be like the message of the Lord Jesus Christ when he came to present himself as Messiah. When he said the kingdom of God is at hand, uh, uh, they're going to be saying the same thing because in a short time the kingdom of God is going to be on earth. And they'll be pleading with people to repent and turn to Christ so that you might be saved. You see, God's great work of both restoring the Jews while reaching the lost is going to be accomplished right here in the tribulation period. Now go back to Revelation chapter 7 because we saw, first of all, the reliability of God that he doesn't leave this world without a witness. Secondly, the restoring of the Jews. And then thirdly, I want you to notice the result of their ministry. What happens when they're restored? Well, look at verse 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number. Notice, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and under the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be under our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Some people ask the question, will this world ever see revival again? The answer is yes, it will. In your lifetime and mine? Mm, I don't know. That's, that's between God, you know, that's God's decision. 
But you know, the greatest revival that this world will ever see is yet to come. Think about it. It's amazing. These 144,000 Jewish evangelists are going to, to be used of God to bring a multitude of people to the Lord. Notice how this group is described. First of all, notice their number. We read in verse 9, And lo, a great multitude, notice, which no man could number. Imagine that. This is going to far surpass what we read of on the day of Pentecost where we say, see, the 3,000 were saved. We say, praise the Lord, revival there, amen. And that's true. It's going to be far beyond that. It's going to be far beyond the estimated 100 million that came to the Lord when Jonah preached in Nineveh. It's going to be much greater than that. It's going to be much more than the three million that followed Moses out of Egypt. Uh, even more than the estimated 500,000 that were saved during the Great Awakening and George Whitfield under his preaching. An innumerable amount of people are going to be saved. So notice the number, but also notice their nationalities. Who do these Jews reach? Well, let me just say this. They're not just reaching Jews. They're doing everything to reach everybody. Just like Christ told us, go ye in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's what they're doing. Notice it's of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues uh, stood before the throne. Imagine people are going to be reached uh, from every nation, uh, from every, every tribe, uh, people that speak every language. Again, this will be the greatest revival that this world has ever seen. But then notice, sadly, if you will, their location. Where are they? Well, in verse 9, it says, where it says, and people and tongues, notice, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Where are they? They're in heaven. They're in heaven. It's interesting because a question is asked in verse 13. One of those 24 elders turns to John. Now, it's kind of a rhetorical question. He says to him, and notice, what are these? Well, let me read the whole thing. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, that's John, what are these which are arrayed in white robes and whence came there? I think he's saying something like this. What do you think about this? Who do you think they are? And he answered, I don't know. I think that's what that means. And he says, sir, thou knowest. I, I have no idea. And the elder says to John in verse 14, and he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Notice these are not church age saints. These are multitudes of people that are saved during the tribulation and here they are already in heaven, which means only one thing to me. They got saved and they got martyred. That's the only answer. They were saved and then they were martyred for their faith. You know, perhaps this is part of the group that was referred to. Look back at chapter 6 in verse 11. And white robes were given unto every one of them. And these are another group of martyrs. Remember what they asked? And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a while, uh, for a little season. Notice, until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. These Jewish evangelists will be used of God to reach many people with the gospel. A great, great revival is going to take place, but also a great slaughter, a wholesale slaughter of anyone that professes Christ as their Savior and refuses to deny the faith. Which leads me to the last thing, number four, the rejoicing in heaven. So John says, they asked John, who do you think these are? And he's told, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. 
Notice verse 15. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. Neither shall the sunlight on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of water. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Can you imagine living during the tribulation? I mean, everything's going to change. Everything. Everybody's priorities are going to change. Everybody's going to be concerned about one thing, survival. It's going to be ugly. But can you imagine experiencing the civil unrest and then experiencing the killing men, killing men all over the place? I personally believe there's not going to be enough law enforcement to do anything about this at that time. It's going to break out that bad. And then on top of that, there's famine. On top of that, there's diseases. There's death. There's natural disasters of a, a worldwide earthquake. The meteors falling and people fleeing to the mountains and men wishing for death. Can you imagine living in that and here comes some man with a message for you and he tells you about the Lord Jesus Christ and how he died for your sins, was buried and rose from the dead. And if you repent of your sin, you can be saved because the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus Christ is coming again. And they get saved. But shortly after that, you're arrested. Because somewhere along the line, somebody's followed that evangelist around. And he's, they've watched the people he's talked to. And they confront them and ask them, are you a Christian? And now it's time to either say, yes, I am, or to deny the faith. And these, obviously, that we're speaking of here, decided to say, I'm a Christian. And they did not recant. And they were arrested for their faith and, and, and tortured uh, uh, for their faith, told they have to deny Christ or die. And they chose, uh, instead of denying their Lord, to die. But when they closed their eyes and opened it up, look what they saw. Jesus Christ. They saw the Lord. Notice, therefore, verse 15, are they before the throne of God? And notice, they serve him night and day. They see the Savior. Their pain is gone. Their journey is done. There's no more, verse 16, no more hunger, no more famine, no more thirst, no more scorching of the sun on their bodies, uh, no more of that heat. Uh, notice in verse 17, for the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away the tears from their eyes. They're in the presence of the Lord. I'd imagine they probably heard or will hear these words. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. I'll tell you what, they probably had a little hallelujah party right there. I'm sure they did. You see, that's what God desires for everyone to be saved. That's what he wants. They want, he wants all of mankind to come to repentance. He wants all of mankind to dwell with him forever. Imagine that. Can I ask you something? And this is kind of, I guess, the application of the whole sermon because... Go to Romans chapter 12, and I want to ask you a question. If God is so concerned about men then, is he just as concerned about men now? 
The answer is yes. And you know, when I think of the book of Romans, and I know I'm preaching through Romans, and I think of Romans chapter 10, 11, and 12, and what that means, those chapters are talking about the nation of Israel and how God raised them up to be a witness for him in this earth. But they committed idolatry, they rejected the Messiah, and they were set aside because of their disobedience to be brought back to the Lord during the tribulation period. And when he sent them aside, he decided to turn and raise up another group. It is this unusual group, if you will, in terms of Scripture in the Old Testament. It is not a Jew that God chose, but it's a combination of Jew and Gentile in one body. And it's called the local New Testament church. And imagine that you and I that are not of the seed of Abraham. Now, some of you may be. I don't know, but I'm not. I'm from European descent. I'm Japheth, you know. I'm not Shem. But anyway, most of us are. Imagine you and I that really would trace our blood, if you will, back to the Canaanites. That's where we're from. And God has given us now this privileged position for us during our lifetime, during this age, before he raptures us out of here, to do one simple thing. And I preached about it this morning. It's almost a repeat. To go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So when we get to Romans chapter 12, as he explains all of this, he says this. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. In other words, understand something. Understand God's mercy. How he saved you. How you were not of the Jew. You were a Canaanite, if you will, a Gentile. And now he's given you and me this privileged position. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you do something that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know what we need today? Just like they're going to have in the tribulation period. We need, most of us, a change of our priorities. You know what most of us, our lives are about? Most of us, for the most part. Us. Sometimes it's good things. Nothing wrong with, you know, trying to raise your family right and doing all that. But the truth is, we've set aside the most important thing God has given us to do. And that is to fulfill the Great Commission. That's what we're here for. You see, those sealed servants during the tribulation period are 144,000 Jewish evangelists that are going to evangelize the world. May I say this? The sealed servants, we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. We have a mark. The sealed servants today are us. We are. So I ask us, why aren't we getting the gospel out knowing and seeing what we see knowing that that is the most important thing for us to do today. You see, this message isn't just about what's going to happen. It needs to apply to what is happening. We need, more than anything, to prioritize the gospel of Jesus Christ. And again, it's like a repeat of this morning. But let's remember what's coming. Christ is coming again. Time is short. It is. Let's prioritize our lives in a way that's pleasing to the Lord. All right, let's pray together. Father.